grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are so incredibly blessed by the health care that we have granted by modern medicine. Here in the province of Ontario, something like 43.2% of the 2016 provincial budget was spent on health care taking care of our fellow citizens, taking care of us. In the ancient world, they didn't have anything like that. There were doctors. We know that Luke the Evangelist was himself a physician. But they didn't have anywhere near the resources or cures or even prevention of problems that we have today. With that in mind, imagine what it would have been like for the people clamoring to have access to Jesus. Jesus, who himself wasn't a physician, but is indeed the great physician, who could heal what nobody else in that day and age could heal. Jesus, who could heal even things that we today don't easily heal. Jesus, who could raise the dead, who could give sight to the blind, who could make the lame man walk, who could restore the man with leprosy. Is it any wonder that the people clamored to get access to Jesus? Because they would have nowhere else to turn. Which brings us to our text for today. Leading up to our text, we hear that Jesus had been in his home t- own hometown, that the people of Nazareth had rejected him because he wouldn't do miracles on command. And so they had even thought that they could kill him. They tried to throw him off a cliff. And then on top of that, just before our text for today, Jesus learns that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded. And John's disciples have taken the body and buried it. And they have come and let Jesus know that John is dead. And so Matthew records that Jesus wanted some time alone. He wanted to escape. He withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. Do you see the heaping on of words, trying to escape the crowds, trying to be alone? You know that same feeling of feeling broken, of trying to escape. You've perhaps been in the washroom and just wanted five minutes to yourself, and you hear someone calling to you from outside the door, And you ask, can I never get any relief? Or you put earbuds in to try and enter into your own little world, listening to music or to podcasts. And suddenly, somebody's tapping you on your shoulder, wanting your attention. You know the feeling of being unable to escape. When the crowds heard Jesus was on the move, they thwarted his plans to get alone time. Jesus doesn't blow a gasket. He doesn't become upset. He doesn't start yelling. He doesn't feel sorry for himself. Coming ashore, he sees a great crowd, and he felt compassion for them. He healed the sick. And Matthew reports that there were 5,000 men, not including the women and the children. You could only imagine a crowd, 20, 25, 30,000 people or more, all clamoring to have access to Jesus, to hear him speak, to have what he had to give. Fast forward to the end of that day. 
maybe about 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon. Don't think long evening being able to sit out and maybe have a campfire. This is near the equator. At 4 o'clock, you start finishing up for the day. You want to be home. You want to be in your house by 6, 6.30 because it will be dark. And so the disciples, they come to Jesus and they say, this is a desolate place. After all, Jesus was trying to get away. And that's exactly where they found him. It's a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Perfectly reasonable course of action. But Jesus responds, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. You see, Jesus himself had been serving these people all day long. And he calls his own disciples to do the same. And it's not unlike what happens for us. He calls us also to be people who serve our neighbors in love. This is love. Loving God and loving your neighbor. Loving your neighbor is not just loving those who are easy to love. Not just sending good vibes out to people. Not just the easy kind of love on a day when you're exchanging vows with your spouse and getting married. No, the real love is the love that imposes itself, that intrudes into your life, that forces its way in. This is the kind of love where you bear with one another during the hard times. It's acting for someone else's welfare, even if you have to sacrifice yourself and your wants and your desires. It means making tough decisions at times, doing for others what they are unable to do. It might mean teaching others so that they can become self-sufficient. The disciples, they, they object to this call to love. They say, we can't do this. We only have five loaves and two fish. But Jesus responds, bring them to me. Commanding the crowds to recline on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he broke them and gave thanks. He blessed God. And then he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples were called to give them to the crowds. And so Jesus not only provided for the physical healing of these people, but he answered and was the answer to their prayer for daily bread. You and I, we are taught to pray for daily bread, but oftentimes we, like the disciples, grumble and complain that our resources are too limited, that we don't have what we need for God to be able to let us serve him as he calls us to do. We feel like the disciples did inadequate. We fail to trust the Lord's provisions that he will supply all of our needs, of body and of soul. And yet the Lord, despite our weakness of faith, despite our unbelief, he also provides for our daily bread. And not just the daily bread of food and clothes, house and home, land, animals, and everything else that we need to support this body and life. But he gives us his own self. Today, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, or whenever next you come and celebrate the Lord's Supper, Jesus is at work. It echoes what he did for the people. He takes what he has received. He blesses God. And then he distributes it. On that first Last Supper night, he doesn't take the bread and multiply it like he did 
for the crowds that were gathered. No, he took the bread that was at the Last Supper, the unleavened bread, and broke it and gave it to his disciples. But this time, this time he acts in a way that the disciples can't understand, but that only Jesus himself can do. Because he says, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Jesus, who is able to feed the 5,000, Jesus, who is able to raise his own body from the dead, is able to give exactly what he promised. His very body that would be hanging on the cross, dying for the sins of the world, dying for their sins. Jesus tells his disciples, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And as we celebrate and come to the Lord's altar, he gives us exactly what he promises. In the book of Hebrews, we read, We have an altar from, the, uh, from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the body of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. When we come to the Lord's table, we come to his altar. The people in Judaism, they went to eat these sacrifices that had been made that really couldn't bring forgiveness of sins. But Jesus, who had been taken outside the city, who had died bodily for the forgiveness of sins, He comes and invites you to his altar to receive that very body for the forgiveness of your sins. Judaism didn't offer forgiveness. Jesus himself does. And it comes in the humble form of bread and wine. We we look at this meal that we come to. We receive just the smallest toast, the smallest morsel of bread, that wouldn't have satisfied the 5,000. They would have left hungry and grumpy. But you and I, he invites to himself, and he gives us just the smallest morsel of bread. But in it, he gives us his very body. And in this meal, he satisfies not just our physical needs, but our deepest spiritual needs. He brings his forgiveness to you. He absolves you. He gives you life. You see, the people clamoring for Jesus, they wanted to be healed. You come to the Lord's table and you receive the meal of immortality. Because Jesus comes with his healing to you, not just to heal you here and now today, but to undo the effect of sin on your life, to forgive you, and to give you a life that does not end. For he who has died and is risen from the dead has died that he might raise you from the dead on the last day and give you a life that has no end. Those people, those clamoring for Jesus, Jesus provided for their daily bread. But for you, Jesus also comes to you and provides for your daily bread. And just like the people clamored for Jesus because they had nowhere else to go, that's why you come and gather here in the midst of his people. This is why you are called to gather here at church. Because here you are not distant from Jesus. It's not that he is 2,000 years too late or far away in heaven. But here in this place, Jesus comes to you with his word. And by that word, gives you his very self. He gives you the meal of immortality. That you may have life in his name. In Jesus' name. Amen.